a multiple award-winning actor, director, and producer, holder of the Order of Canada, Governor General's Award, currently starring in, and I can't wait for the beginning of the second season of Anne with an E, uh, to watch what is an incredible reboot of that series on CBC and Netflix, and uh, he is an incredible Matthew Cuthbert. He's also a producer, or the producer of the tribute to the fallen in the First World War, The World Remembers. Please welcome R.H. Thompson. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's delicious to be here. How do I work this? A green moves it, right? Yes. And what takes it back? Oh, red takes it back. Okay, good. All right, now that we've settled the technology. Uh, it is a total pleasure to be in this room with so much talent and so much history and so much art. The arts are really a family for me. I just, my family gets bigger and bigger and you know, the grandkids are born and the great grandkids are born and I have arts family in Vancouver and Halifax, everywhere. And this is just an extension of my family, there we go. I also wanna say what an honor it is to be in the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat. And most recently, the Mississaugas and the New Credit. And so that makes me ask, who is missing from this room? And this is not a criticism. This is actually a statement of where we are, where we're going, who we've been, and where we're going to. And I, I'm white. I see a lot of white out there, and that's fantastic. You know? And I see some non-white, and I see some mixed colors, but I don't see almost any First Nations. Rock on. And this is not an indictment. This is not a criticism. This is just saying, this is a reflection of the road from which we came Whatever bump it was, whatever gorgeous triumph it was, artists have to see the landscape on which they create. So, we know the landscape. I also think a life in the arts is like, is like being in the back of a truck traveling up a, a long, winding mountain road. Right, the truck is bouncing along, and all the artists are in the back. We're desperately trying to stay on, you know. We're trying to stay in the middle. We're trying to create. We're trying to compose. We're trying to draw. We're trying to perform. This, but it's there's no barriers on this mountain road between the cliff and the road. And sometimes, you know, you try to keep in the middle of the truck because you don't want to get bounced off, and you want to keep working, whatever. And then someone gets near the edge, and they get shaky, and then people disappear. And people fall over the edge. And people, and I cannot tell you how many people in my lives, how many great artists have just suddenly gone silent. And I hate that. You go, what happened to so-and-so? And it's like the light goes out. The silence descends because there's no longer the opportunities or the creation or the voice. And their voice leaves the symphony, so to speak. And I hate that because it's a choir. And all our voices are there. So, um, we all know, given the age in this room, um, you know, the end of the career time. I sometimes think it's as hard to find work at the end of your career as it was at the beginning of your career. You know, the beginning of your career, you're trying to get going, you're not trying to get a gallery, you're trying to get a job, you're trying to get this, you're trying to get that, you're trying to get a show. Well, that's the same now. Um, I've had my own end of career, um, you know, a long series of, oh my God, what I own, Jesus, there's not much going on here, what am I going to do, um, um, and that kind of stuff, and okay, and then we're, we're going out to audition for the TV, right, you know, the TV, maybe that'll pay the bills, and you get the sides, and you read the sides, and go, oh, who wrote this shit, and then you go... <laughs> No, 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 I shouldn't say that. This, 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 this writer is obeying formula. Uh, and then you go out and you say, okay, 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 I'll, I'll audition for it, right? I'll do this, okay, audition for it. And, you know, and then you self-tape and then you do this and you think, well, I don't really, I don't really want to be in what I'm auditioning for. Um, you know, of course, you got to work, I need a paycheck, but, you know, I, 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 you know, and you watch the formula the industry, right? The endless tension between the art and the industry. And you watch the formula roll in to the art. 
And sometimes when I go to theater schools, I say, formula is a plastic bag that you pull over your head. <laughs> and the two hands that hold the bag around your neck are fear and ambition. That's it, basically. And so part of me fears for the younger, for the younger artists. It was nice, you know, when we didn't have much of an industry because there wasn't money to be made and the only people who got industry, into the industry were crazy enough and passionate enough that they wanted to do it. But as soon as the money started, I think it was $1.4 billion worth of film and television was done here last year. As soon as the money rolls in, the game changes and the industry starts to push into the art. I won't go on. So, um, I, th I mean, literally, I thought the end of my days had come. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> I do want to talk about, you know, a little bit about white male privilege. Um, you got to acknowledge where you are, no, because, again, I'm totally privileged being up here. A, I'm white, and B, I'm a male. And, you, again, that's it's just where you are. You've got to see how that works. So this is me branching out. This is me reaching out. Um, where am I going here? So uh, it, it, just in, in terms of in my end of career, doldrums elapsed, the end of it. I literally thought my film and television career was dead. Uh, the coffin was prepared. I'm lying in the coffin. The lid is going on the coffin. I feel the Makita drill going, <laughs> putting the screws in. Because, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I, there was a branch of television at the top that I really wanted to do, but there was the mm, all that down there. I thought, I just, it doesn't feed me in any way. And then, and with an E came along. Um, uh, but I will not say that for one of the first things they said to me is we don't have to cast a Canadian here. <laughs> so Anne with an E came along and that's what this is. And suddenly it's a creative opportunity that I am so honored and privileged to be part of. But lest we take ourselves too seriously, uh, this is the final shot that we did. We shot the second season. I thought it was getting a bit serious. We were doing a final scene around the table. So that's Marilla and Anne and me and we're called the Cuthbert or Order the Bottle. Um, the industry's cruel. The industry's cruel in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of age. And we all know that. Uh, I'm a white male, so I've had much better, uh, my, my dice rolls better than if I'm a white woman or a black woman or a South Asian woman or South Asian or South Asian man. So I do have, you've got to see all those kind of cruelties that have been built into the industry, so to speak. Some of them unconscious and none of them, none of them maliciously intended, but they are there. And so we've all felt that. And I only bring it up to say this is what we're working our way out of. And that's the reason why I keep mentioning that this is where we're trying to drive out from to a far more interesting and a far more, in, in the, Chief Stacy Laforme asked me a little credit for his book, uh, Walking Through the Tall Grass, uh, his book of poetry. And I end up thinking, you know, uh, we've sort of been living a half-life. We've been very vibrant, we've built a huge art scene, we've built a huge industry, but actually Canada has been living a half-life because we have not and we're finally saying we have to look at that relationship. And when we actually come back into that relationship with all our peoples, then we will enter into full life of what this country is. And I find that as an artist totally exciting. The same as in, you know, 1972, we're going, okay, so how do we do Canadian plays? How do we not do, you know, just the American and the British plays? How do we do it? How are we trying to push Canadian authors? Well, I think that's this push now is to move from a half-life country, which has been done really well, but actually become a full-life country. And no other country in the world has done this. And again, Canada is then on the cutting edge, the leading edge of how do we create this new kind of culture and this new kind of society. So my reaction to, my reaction to the last lap, what I call the last lap of the career, is to stay flexible you become more and more and more flexible. I just don't uh, play the, uh, the, the older lawyer, lawyer in the law firm. I'll play anything. I'll play the janitor. I'll play the guy who dresses up weird. I'll play anything. And the more flexibility you get, the more opportunity that appears to you. Um, 
the career, the opportunities, you know, do you sit at home? We all know this. Do you sit at home waiting for your email or your Instagram to click? No, you don't. You get out there. You do stuff. You think up ideas. You think up initiatives. And that's how you keep the game rolling, so to speak. Um, I hate formula. As I say, it's a plastic bag in which creativity suffocates to death. So anywhere, anytime, I try to push against it, which means I basically... I work the margins, so to speak. I don't live in the center of the industry, I live on the margins of the industry. And so what you try to create, and the creators you try to associate with, the writers, the producers, the composers, the DOPs, uh, the designers, are all looking for that, that kind of... Uh, This uh, is a project that produced in Trafalgar Square. That's a projection on the side of Canada House. We did that in 2008. We projected it at night. And that all came up because I was looking for opportunities. I had no work. So I go, okay, 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 okay. What do you do? Uh, actors write one-person shows. That's what we do. You, you write a show for yourself. Yeah, you write a show for yourself. And, and then you play a show around the world. Okay, okay, we do that. Right? You got to work. You got to work. Right, okay. So I go, I got to write a show. I got to write a show. Um, and I wrote this story about the, my uncles, the four brothers, uh, four of the five brothers who didn't make it through World War I. And I have all their letters, and I performed this show, and I did it in Ottawa and Toronto and Winnipeg. And almost every night, people came to my dressing room. All right, it's a one-man show. So at the end of the one-man show, you're kind of sitting in your dressing room going, oh, my God, I got through it one more time. I wasn't called out as a charlatan one more time. And people came to my dressing room. You know, the first eight seconds was... Uh, Oh, well, that's an interesting show, or, um, oh, that's good, or whatever. And then almost everyone started telling me their family story. And after a couple of months, I'm going, what is going on here? And I sat there, and I heard these stories. And their stories were far more powerful than anything I told. And so I realized these stories sit in all of us. In this case, it was stories about family. It was stories about where they came from, stories about relatives who got lost, lost in the wars. And the passion of those stories that people just poured out to me in the dressing room every night, I thought, this has got to be addressed in some way. So then we dreamed about the project called The World Remembers, which is saying, you know, this is dealing with World War I, the centenary, it killed uh, 16 million people, and we always remember them, and I find remembering them no longer appropriate. You have to remember Robert, Mary, Louise, Georges, Emile, Sanjay, you have to remember them because we live in the arts. And we know that actually memory and power depends on your absolute specificity, right? Don't get general on your canvas. You don't get general with your composition. You don't get general with your acting. You get specific. And so we thought if we actually name those who were killed in World War I, we think really strongly about what happened. So we did 68,000 Canadian names here in Trafalgar Square. I'm down there very jet-lagged. Her Majesty is there. It weren't, turned out really well. And then after that worked, um, then it became very obvious to me, if you are talking about the... If you are thinking of the country who... If you remember World War I and commemorate it in the way that the country was in 1914, that's one way of remembering it. But if you commemorate or remember the history of conflict, World War I, in the way that we are now, that is a different approach to memory. And if you are going to commemorate or remember World War I in the way we are now, you have to name everyone because Canada is everyone. So you have to name the young man from the Punjab who was killed. You have to name the young man from Slovenia who was killed. The young man from Vietnam who was killed, the young man from the United States who was killed, the young man from Germany who was killed, the young man from Turkey, from Czech Republic, from Slovakia. So we said, okay, crazy idea, I didn't think it would work. You have to name everyone. So I've only had 14 countries in, oh, there you go. But we, we run this display now, and what happens is we show the names 100 years after they, were, after they were killed, and the display coming up, that was the display on Toronto City Hall last year. And every 15 minutes, we show photographs because we want to see the young Vietnamese. And in this case, we want to see the Canadian nurses. You want to see the Ukrainians who are behind barbed wire down here, the CNE. You want to see everyone. You want to see the woman who is a munitions worker. And so this was the uh, prologue slide. OK, there's three languages up there, English, French, and 
This is our prologue slide that we did in Toronto and Ottawa. And I have to be, because I have some federal money in this, have to be officially bilingual. And I was looking at the designs going, oh, what's, there's something missing. It's Ojibwe. So this is in English, French, and Ojibwe, because that's actually the roots from where we came. And on the top, there's a list of all the languages. And Algonquin's up there is because it was in Ottawa as well. And I just want to say, OK, so here we are. I just, it's the faces of the people. trying to break free of the mold of the formula of the way that you've approached memory and commemoration. And it's all about telling the stories of others. And in the second row, second nurse from the left is actually my godmother, and which is why I have these pictures, because she took them. So it's these connections was the inspiration for Three Day Road. Okay, look at that. That's me. <laughs> um, so, so go back to us. We are in the arts. Tell the stories of others. How do you get by? And uh, in my profound ignorance, um, and maybe because I'm a nerd. Um, when I was a young artist, I thought, oh my God, should I go to theater school? Oh my God, oh my God, am I, am I really, am I really? I knew lots of people said, oh yeah, I'm an actor. Oh, I'm an artist. And I'm like, oh, I don't, know. I don't have that kind of certainty. You know that old aphorism, you know, nothing has more confidence than no talent. <laughs> and I, I didn't have confidence. And I thought, oh, so, I, so I'm asking some of my teachers, should I go to theater school? You know, you know I'll, I'll go and teach physics, or you know, I'll do a degree in science. I'll go and teach physics. And no, enough of them said, you know, Robert, you know, you have some talent. You should, you should, you should go on with it. So I did. And then I found, as I was struggling and starting out, um, that is the mentor program that you're setting up. It was kind of informal mentor. That the, the opinions of the seniors meant a lot to me. And I, because you're lost, you know, you're starting your career, I'm lost, how do I, 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 how do I navigate Stratford? Oh my God, how do I do this? I, and I didn't have the confidence. So when the Martha Henrys of the Douglas Reigns had a terrible incident with John Hurst, I was what called Hurst, where you retreat your room for three days and you don't speak uh, because the way he dealt with you in the rehearsal hall and you go, I, I don't even know which way is up and I don't know if my name is Robert, and I, am, I, am I rehearsing tomorrow? I don't know what to do. So going to Martha and Douglas uh, is a way I found was like putting some certainty and some guidance into way where I was going. And so the advice of those who had gone before was extremely useful to me as I had stumbled my way forward. Whether it's working with a DOP in a film set whether it's looking at art and the art gallery, whether it's listening to a new composition, whether it's watching a new dance piece, whether it's working on a new script, the voices of those who have gone before always helped me, were the kind of guiding GP. Not they, they were telling me where to go and what was right, was because some of the old actors are terrible. I'm sorry. You know? And I'm sure I'll be seen as a terrible actor to the younger actors. You know? <laughs> And the, and the arts is constantly changing. The culture that the, that the arts is talking about is constantly changing, and the community is constantly changing. So how do we deal with it? A bit like the world remembers. Do you remember the world in the way that it was, or do you remember it in the way that we are now? So that's the point, that it is all changing fast. And the community changing is changing fast. And you can't, I don't think you can create without a community. Or you can be an independent contractor. Well, the moment you become an independent contractor, you're dead. Sorry. Go do something else. But you have to have a community to create. I know there are some, I know there are some wonderful artists who actually work in isolation, but most of us need a community to go to. And that community is what's changing so fast. And uh, to give you an example, I think Canada went through three huge stages of kind of opening its eyes to who we are and where we're trying to go to. And the first one was Air India, the bombing of Air India way back in 84, 85, remember? And for months it was, oh yeah, those, uh, yeah, it was a, it's, this is an Indian problem. These are, you know, Punjabi terrorists and uh, this is an Air Indian play and it wasn't Canadian. 
And we looked at it. Oh yeah, right. Oh yeah. They, oh yeah. So, so most of the most of the victims say they had just emigrated from the Punjab and they were living in Vancouver. Or there are a lot of Indian nationals on that plane. So it remained, it remained a tragedy that wasn't Canadian. And then over a series of about five or six years, that changed in Canada, and the people on that aircraft became Canadian in our consciousness. They stopped being all those people who came from the Punjab and moved to Vancouver to the Delta, and they became Canadian. And that took six or seven years to happen. But you could feel the country go around that perceptual idea that this was Canada that was blown up in that plane, not some people from India. Meher Arar is another one. Meher Arar and the time gap between, oh yeah, they're, oh yeah, no, they came from Lebanon. Oh yeah, no, he's Syrian. Oh yeah, he's Egyptian. The timeline between that and no, he's a Canadian is getting shorter and shorter, right? The Vietnamese boat people, that took a long time. Meher Arar took about three weeks. When we figured out that Meher Arar, and it was his wife who did it, when Meher Arar was picked up, right, CSIS gave information that was not correct and they gave it to the American uh, security and he was picked up in New York and he was taken to a dark, he was taken to Syria and he was tortured and his wife started saying, this guy is Canadian. We went, no, no, he's this guy. He's just moved to Canada. And within weeks, he actually became Canadian. And when May Harar became Canadian, we, we moved very quickly and saying, this is who we are. This is where we're going. And Omar Khadr is the last one. And Omar Khadr challenges in Totally different way. You could hear the you could hear the debate right between the Harper the Harper conservatives and, and the rest of Canadians saying no Omar Khadr you know the Khadr family they're all terrorists right they're all against every Canadian value, but we had learned by that point no these people are now Canadian deal with them in a Canadian way bring them back putting them in a Canadian jail don't don't try them in Guantanamo Bay, and Meherar was difficult because his family was supported, pretty awful people pretty awful terrorist movement. But Omar Khadr is Canadian. And this shows, is an indication of how quickly we are starting to understand who we are and where we're going. So, because it all's all changing so quickly, and because of the young artists coming up behind us, like this young artist, whatever he was in 1972. Oh yeah, that's me. No, that's the one I'm talking about, Angelo. That's the visit. That's uh, Glenn Moore's church. Now I'm, that's me acting a mayor a Swiss mayor when I was like 19. Oh, let's go back, okay. The younger artists are in a far more volatile environment than we are, than we were when we started. And it is that volatility is a time of great creation, great danger, great possibility. And it's that volatility of community that's energizing, so to speak. Compared to, it was volatile when we went through it, of course we did. But nothing on the volatility that's going now. It's uh, complicated in f by the fact that a lot of it's moved online. That the communities now are dealing more online. They're on Snapchat, they're on Instagram, they're on Facebook. And we come from a generation where the community is the community. You meet in the bar, you meet in the theater, you meet in the dance hall, you meet whatever. You become a community. This room is a community. So with the changing communities, as it were, and this challenge of the community is now shifting to an online community where it's all about that, which is very good, but it's, it ain't in the flesh. And I'm sorry, the arts are in the flesh, so to speak. How do we deal with that? So I throw that together with the fact that Robert, when he was young, went, oh, I need Martha Henry to help me out here. I need Douglas Rain. Uh, Douglas Campbell was someone I went to all the time. You know, when I was just, I was losing my barbell, says, I don't know which way is up, Douglas. And so I would check in with Douglas every two years or every three months or whatever, and I would get kind of a reality check. I'm sure we all have these people in our lives, but they're important. So this is partly the mentor program that CSAR is doing. But I want to suggest that it's what, not what we can do for ourselves as artists, it's what we can do for them. That they're the future of the arts. And we're in the arts as well, because we tend to, tend to create. You're in law, we do all wonderful things. But it's also what can we do for them as they move into this even more challenging, more volatile way of creating, finding a way to create, finding a platform, making a film. So I've always loved the, the group, the Raging Grannies. You know the Raging Grannies? Wow, who would have thought? It? 
they should have gone quiet. What's going on? I don't know there. What about the raging artists? Why don't we have roving bands of ad hoc artists who rove around and they support ventures. They support artists. They support galleries. They go to the coal mine theater. They go to that theater. And we just turn up. We could be a group. There could be five of us. There could be 20 of us. And we turn up. And we go to the performance. And then we say, we're all buying you a drink afterwards. Because what we think you're doing is fantastic. And this is what we did when we were young. And look at you doing when you're young. And this would be a, could be ad hoc, could be totally improvised, or you could actually schedule it. So that the young companies all over, whether you're a dance company or whether you're, you know, OCAD or wherever you are, that this roving band of crazed senior artists will turn up to support you in some way. And that's a kind of, to create that kind of bond, but also to throw energy at them, to throw confidence at them. To say to them, what you are doing is important, even though you feel marginalized, even though you feel whatever. And I think that energy coming out of this kind of group would actually, well, you know, the other, this is the other adage, right, full of adages. I think adages collect in the brain like plaque. <laughs> so the other adage I learned as a, as a young actor was, if you dry on stage, right, you're up in performance and you dry and you're absolutely stuck, what do you do? What the fuck do I say? What the fuck do I say? What the fuck do I say? No, no. What you do is you think of what can I do for my fellow actor. So when I'm in trouble on stage saying, I don't know, what's going on? What do I say? How can I help Scott? And by thinking, how can I help Scott or you or the other actors on my stage, you lose the lock on your own problem and things start moving again. And it works. Having been dried, it works. You think, what can I do for you? the other actor on stage, and usually pull out of it. What happens if we have a roving grand, uh, band of angry, impassioned artists? We, don't have to, we can come up with some title, the impassioned, the artist's impassioned movement or something. And literally, we would, we would hit these theaters, and we hit these galleries. And we would go to, a, you know, Ryerson will be showing their new production, of their, fi their fourth year students will be showing production. So we turn up, right? And we buy them drinks, and we tell them how great they are. I think that's really, really important. This is my last slide. This is my, this is my senior artist talking to me. Like a Douglas Campbell, like a Martha Henry. This is in the Chauvet painting. These were painted 32,000 years ago. These artists were extraordinary. 32,000 years ago. Their art was that sophisticated, that expressive. And so they're the senior, senior artists who I listen to. I got my son to do me a big blow up. I mounted up on the, on the wall in my home. And we know it's 32,000 years ago because the, it was deep in a cave. It's about 150 meters inside the cave. So it was absolutely pitch black. A bit of a metaphor for the arts, right? They worked in the by in the darkness. So they had to work by torchlight. And we know it's 32,000 years ago because we know that they took their torches and then, you know, the torches would burn down and they banged them on the top of the cave so the embers would fall off and the torch would get brighter. So not only do we see the carbon where they took the torch 32,000 years ago and got to be brighter, but we see the bits of wood on the floor that fell off from the torch. So came out 32,000 years ago. So they are speaking. They inspire me. They keep me going. I know how brief my life is, how tiny my life is, how short my life is. But I want to leave behind those kind of embers, you know, that kind of mark on the top of the cave, so that the people, the artists who come behind will pick up and can move on from that. And I think that's why we're here. Thank you very much.